عندنا نمثل الموقوف الموقوف قول علي بن ابي طالب رضي الله عنه وعلي الصحابي ليس في اقل من 200 درهم صدقه فهذا قول منسوب الى علي رضي الله عنه فنسميه الموقوف ايضا عمر رضي الله تعالى عنه جاء في مصنف ابن ابي شيبه عن الاسود النخعي انه قال كان عمر رضي الله عنه يرفع يديه في الصلاه حذو منكبيه يرفع يديه في الصلاه حذو منكبيه فهنا فعل اضيف الى عمر رضي الله تعالى عنه واضافه الفعل الى الصحابي تعد من الموقوف فهذان مثالان يبينان الموقوف فاسناد الفعل هنا الى عمر واسناد القول في الذي قبله الى علي وكلاهما صحابي قد اسند اليه الحديث فيسمى الموقوف نعم the sheikh of the law ta'ala says so now let's make an example an example of al-manquf is that which was stated by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu and of course he was a companion there isn't any sadaqah due on that which is less than 200 dirham there is no charity due on anything less than 200 dirham he says so therefore this is manquf this is something that Ali radiallahu anhu said and he did not attribute it to the he did not attribute it to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam instead it is attributed to him there's another example of al manquf is that which is um, collected in the musannaf of ibn abi shayba on the authority of al aswad al nakhai rahimahullah who said that umar radiyallahu anhu used to raise his hands in the prayer to the top of his shoulders or to to towards his shoulders he says so therefore this is an action a fi'l which is attributed to umar radiyallahu anhu and umar is a sahabi he is a companion so therefore this is called mawquf so therefore the first example was a statement and the second example was a fi'l was an action these are both act, uh, examples of that which is called al mawquf naam ثم بعد ذلك ننتقل إلى النوع الآخر وهو المقطوع وهو الموقوف على التابع قولا أو فعلا يعني ما وقف على التابع فأضيف إليه من قوله أو فعله فإن نسميه المقطوع وآثار التابعين مهمة لأن وقد اهتم بها العلماء رحمهم الله وذكروها في المدونات لأن التابعين رضي الله تعالى عنهم أدركوا الصحابة رضي الله عنهم وعرفوا السنن فهم أقرب إلى فهمها على وجهها الصحيح من غيرهم و فائدة ذكرها في المصنفات وأن الإنسان إذا كان للتابعين قول واحد في المسألة فلا يجوز استحداث قول ثان وإذا كان لهم قولان فلا يجوز إحداث قول ثالث بل إن الإنسان يختار من أقوالهم ما يوافق الدليل وأما ما أجمعوا عليه واتفقوا وليس لهم فيه إلا رأي واحد فلا يجوز له الخروج عن هذه الأقوال عن هذا القول نمثل للمقطوع قول مجاهد رضي الله عنه لا يؤكل من صيد المجوس إلا الحيتان والجراد حيتان له السمك والجراد دواب تطير في الهواء هي معروفة نعم 
إيه؟ فهذه لأنها لأن ميتتها حلال لأن ميتتها حلال فلذلك أبيحت من المجوسي لأن أهل الكتاب اليهود والنصارى تجوز أكل ذبائحهم ما لم يعلم أنهم أهلوا بها لغير الله أو ذبحوها على غير الصفة الشرعية من إنهار الدم أما غيرهم فإنه لا يجوز أكل ذبيحته يقول لا يؤكل من صيد المجوس إلا الحيتان والجراد لأن بقية الصيد لا بد فيها من الذكاة الشرعية أو من الصيد أو لأنها في حكم الذكاة الشرعية لأنها تصاد على اسم الله تعالى فقول مجاهد لا يؤكل من صيد المجوس إلا الجراد والحيتان هذا أضيف إلى مجاهد وهو من قوله ومجاهد تابعي من أوساط التابعين فنسمي هذا المقطوع نسميه أو يسمى المقطوع كذلك الإمام مالك رحمه الله روى في الموطأ عن القاسم بن محمد أنه كان لا يرفع يديه في شيء أنه كان يقرأ خلف الإمام إلا فيما يجهر فيه بالقراءة والقاسم بن محمد بن أبي بكر الصديق فهو من التابعين فأضيف الفعل إليه فهذا يسمى المقطوع والإمام مالك رحمه الله ممن أكثر من ذكر الآثار خاصة يعني آثار أهل المدينة علماء المدينة سواء من الصحابة أو من التابعين نعم نعم الشيخ حفظه الله تعالى says we will go on to another category which is called المقطوع the type or the category called المقطوع and المقطوع is that which is um, attributed to a tabi'i whether it is a statement or an action it's just like a mawkuf but it's to the tabi'i and not the sahabi the shaykh of the Lord Ta'ala says here we previously mentioned that that which is attributed from statement and action to a companion is a mawkuf narration so now we're mentioning that which is maqtu' the athar of the tabi'in of the students of the sahaba and the disciples of the sahaba he says here the scholars once again have placed a great deal of importance on this type or on, on these types of narrations and they've mentioned them in their dawawin in their books and in their recordings of the sunnah and of the narration of the sunnah uh, and the reason behind their importance why these athar are so important is because they lived with the Sahaba and they reached the time of the Sahaba and lived in the time of the Sahaba and they knew of the acts of Sunnah what was from the Sunnah what wasn't Sunnah similarly they have a, their understanding is closer to that which is correct it's closer to that which is correct than our understanding he says here so therefore the ulama they have mentioned in the musannafat they have mentioned the athar of the tabi'een so if we find that the tabi'een agree upon something it's unlawful for someone to come behind them and differ and say this khilaf now or if we find the tabi'een having two statements the person is to look into their two, these two views, these two opinions and choose that which is closest to the evidence and not to make a third opinion not to make ihdath to innovate a third opinion we find the tabi'een only having two views he brings a third view, he says this is incorrect this here is incorrect um, then he says let's mention an example of al-maqtu' an example of al-maqtu' is the statement of Mujahid rahimahullah the great scholar of, ta- of the tabi'een 
in which he said, nothing from the game of the Magians or the fire worshippers, the Majus, nothing should be eaten except for fish and locusts. Nothing is lawful to be eaten from that which a Majusi, a fire worshipper, hunts as, except for fish and locusts. And another translation, grasshoppers. He says, Nam. This is because these things are halal even if they die by themselves. Fish, if they die by the, rather, the, the fish in the sea, if it dies by itself, it's lawful to eat. If a grasshopper or locust dies by itself without being hunted, then it is lawful to eat. He says, as for the rest of the slaughterings or that which is hunted by a majusi, then it is unlawful as we know. And it's a condition that the person either be a Jew or a Christian. Either be a Jew or a Christian with regards to slaughtered meats and with regards to that which is hunted. That which is hunted, the Sayyid, game. He says, it's lawful for us to eat the food, uh, the slaughtered meats and the hunted food of the, uh, of the, 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 the people of the book. He says, the, rather, the Sheikh says, the, the, ba'ih, the slaughtering, the slaughtered foods of the people of the book, as long as it is not slaughtered for other than Allah, and as long as it is slaughtered according to the legislative manner, that the blood is, the blood pours out, that it's slaughtered correctly. He says, as for the Majusi, then no, then no. And then the Shaykh Hafizullah Ta'ala, he says, so, so the point here is an example, faqat. It's just a mithal. It's not to discuss the issue over the meats, over the slaughter. It's just a mithal. Tayyip. He says, this is an example of maktur because it is attributed to Mujahid. Rahimahullah. And Mujahid was from the middle rank of the Tabi'een. He wasn't from the Kibara Tabi'een, nor was he from the Sigara Tabi'een. Rather, he was from the uh, Wasat. He was Wasat from the Tabi'een. Another example of Maktur is that which is reported by Imam Malik on the authority of Al Qasim ibn Muhammad. That Al Qasim ibn Muhammad, Rahimahullah, would never recite behind the Imam if the Imam recited out loud. If it was a prayer that was recited out loud, Al Qasim ibn Muhammad would not recite. We find here that Al Qasim ibn Muhammad is the son of who? Of Abu Bakr, a Sadiq radiallahu anhu. He is from the Tabi'een. This action is attributed to him that he did not recite if it was a jahriya. If it was a prayer that was recited out loud. So therefore this is called maqtur. Because it's attributed to a tabi'i. He says, and Imam Malik rahimahullah was from those scholars who made an abundant mention of the athar. If, uh, Malik made a lot of dhikr of the athar in his muwatta. Specifically the athar of the people of al-Madinah and the ulama of al-Madinah.